Signs, signs everywhere. Signs blocking all the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the signs? Well, I got five signs for you today. This is Lisa from LisaRobinYoung.com coming at you with another live edition of Creative Freedom. This is your dose of education and inspiration to help you own your dreams without selling your soul. I've got five signs for you today that you might not be a creative entrepreneur. Five signs you might not really be, maybe that's a better way to say it. Five signs that you might not really be a creative entrepreneur. Hey Jill, nice to see you here. Um, feel free to hop into the comments if something moves you. That's what these lives are all about. Um, this is actually an excerpt from my new book that's coming out this fall. It's called Creative Freedom, How to Own Your Dreams Without Selling Your Soul. It's a guide to personal and financial success as a creative entrepreneur. And this is one of the um, opening stories, if you will, from the book, because in order to really get into the conversation of the creative freedom entrepreneur type spectrum, which is part of what the book covers, we talk about what your type, what the types are, and then how to build a business doing what you love that takes advantage of your type's ninja skills and kind of counteracts any of the blind spots that are unique to your particular creative type. And one of the conversations that I have pretty regularly with people is around what it even means to be a creative entrepreneur. A lot of people think I have to be a maker. I have to be an artiste. I have to be a painter, a dancer, a singer. I have to create something. I've got to be crafty. And, and contrary to what you might think, it has absolutely zilch, nothing, nada to do with what it is that you're creating or how you're creating. Remember, the spectrum goes from the very linear, who are like thought leaders, they are pattern finders, problem solvers, all the way to the other end of the chaotic end of the spectrum. These are the folks that can be very crafty. They're the ones we typically identify as creatives, um, but they are all creatives. In fact, we are all creatives. Hi, Rachel, so good to see you here. Our KA is in the hack house, so excited. So. The indicator then isn't whether or not you're creative because everybody is creative in some way. Everybody, and I mean that truly and sincerely. So this is more about whether or not you're seeing yourself as an entrepreneur, okay? So the creative part, you're a human being, you're a creator. You got that part on lock. Now it's about are you really getting a handle on this entrepreneur piece? And if not, then you might not really be a, a creative entrepreneur, and that's that's totally okay, there's nothing wrong with that. All entrepreneurs are creative, but not all creatives are entrepreneurs, and that's totally fine. Elizabeth Gilbert was, she had a day job when she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. In fact, if you've read her book, Big Magic, she talks about how she kind of held on to that job, and she was like, I made a commitment not to put the pressure on my creative gift of writing, to be the thing that sustains me and feeds me and keeps me alive. She didn't want that kind of pressure and she wasn't willing to let go of her day job until she got to the point where, you know, Eat, Pray, Love was this runaway success and she was making pretty good money, I will bet, because she probably wouldn't have left that day job otherwise. Um, but you don't have to make good money, lots and lots of mega bucks, to be a creative entrepreneur. Um, you might not make any money when you start and you would still be considered a creative entrepreneur. So how do you know for sure? Well, today I've got these five signs that you can kind of follow along with and check them off and see if you are or are not a creative entrepreneur. So the first sign is you don't even want to make money doing what you love. Like the money is like, eh, you know, if I make money at it, great. It's more about this thing that I really want to do. You know, for the purposes of my book, if you're creating as a hobbyist or for side income and you don't really plan to ever make it your primary source of income, then you're not a creative entrepreneur. And there's nothing wrong with that. I did community theater 
for a long time when I lived back in Flint and we would get a little stipend every once in a while. Or if I played with the orchestra, I would, you know, get a little paycheck. This was not going to pay my rent. This was not going to keep food on the table for my family, but it was a little bit of money, covered my gas, got me there and back. And it was, you know, a fun thing to do. This was not my primary income. I was not doing this to be a creative entrepreneur in community theater. Like that was not the gist. I was doing it because I loved the people. I loved getting together with these folks and creating something that told a story that inspired people to go make their lives a better than they were before they came to the show. That was really my, my motivation. So, you know, as a creative, you can create for yourself and not care what anybody else thinks about your work. That's the beauty of creating for the sake of creation. Um, that doesn't mean you can't create for yourself and your own enjoyment if you're gonna be a creative entrepreneur. One of my favorite examples of this is Jim Henson, the guy who created the entire Muppet franchise. You know, He actually started in the very commercial world. He used his puppets to sell insurance and coffee and other things like that. And then he was approached to create the children's television workshop show, Sesame Street. And when he made that decision, he changed his perspective on, well, if I'm going to use these puppets as a means to connect with children, I've got to completely step away from anything commercial. And so for years, he wouldn't sell a Kermit the Frog doll. He wouldn't do anything that was commercial because he didn't want to disrupt the messaging that he was sending to those kids through educating them. And it took a little bit of effort for him to shift his perspective and see, okay, there's a way that we can do this and sell merchandise to these kids and still maintain the integrity of the mission of what Sesame Street was all about. And from there, he's grown this, you know, huge, huge brand around what it, you know, the Sesame Street Children's Television Workshop, the Muppets, all of that. But not all of it was profitable. And some of it he did because he wanted to create it, not because he wanted it to make money. I'm thinking in particular of Labyrinth and the Dark Crystal. These two are, you know, cult classic films now, but they really didn't make a lot of money. They were not commercial successes. And he knew he had to do other things to make the money that would allow him to make the art. So he had a very clear perspective of these are the things that I do on the commercial side that make money that fund the things that I do because I want to create them for the world. And if people show up, great. And if they don't, I'm still putting this out into the world because it has meaning for me. So being able to have that clarity, money is freedom for creatives. You know, it gives you the ability to do what you want to do without having to bear the criticism of other people. And so maybe you don't want to make a living at it. Maybe you just want to keep it as this little sacred thing for you. And that's totally fine. Hi, Tracy. It's so good to see you here. Thank you for joining us today. So that's the first thing. If you don't want to make a living at it, if you don't have any intention, you're not a creative entrepreneur. You could make some money and money could come your way. You're knitting scarves and people love them. And they want to give you 25 bucks for them. But you're not a creative entrepreneur because you're not trying to make this a going concern. So the number two, which kind of goes along with this, the number two sign that you might not really be a creative entrepreneur is that you don't treat it like a real business. Maybe you get a little tiny trickle of money and you spend, 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 spend. Okay? You're not treating this <laughs> like a real business. Are you creating for a specific audience? Do you have a clear idea of who you're here to serve? Businesses have two purposes. Okay? One, they're here to serve a certain subset of the human race. They're here to serve a market. Okay? Clients. And two, they got to make a profit. They've at least got to break even. They've got to bring in enough money to keep all the bills paid. Every business has two, those two things at its core, all right? But beyond that and how you do that, there are these myriad approaches to take that and make that happen. But you also have to establish yourself as a legal structure. At least in the United States, you do. You have to report the income and expenses. You have to pay the taxes. You have to track things. You've you got to know where the money's coming and going. You can't just spend spend, spend, and never see any money come in because then you don't have a business. And we talked about that in our last episode. You've got an expensive hobby or you've got a jobby and you don't want to fall into that trap either. If you want to make this a going concern, you've got to put the right 
things in place, structures, processes. You can't just leave all of that stuff to chance or you might not have a, a business in place. And, and there's, again, nothing wrong with that. Teresa says it sounds like me with dance. She's a phenomenal um, Egyptian dance. Just, she's amazing. If you've not seen any of her stuff, she's beautiful, right? Uh, Rachel says, Jobby is brilliant. That's not mine. I stole that from Carol Roth. Carol Roth wrote the book, The Entrepreneur Equation. Um, and she basically says that a jobby is a hobby disguised as a business. You haven't created a business for yourself. You've created a job, a second job for yourself, where you're probably not even making minimum wage. So if you've got a hobby, it might be bringing a little money, that's great. If you've got a jobby, you're probably not making a ton of money, but you feel like you're making some money, so it's okay, and you set up the structures, and you're like, oh, I, I've, I've registered as the DBA, and I'm, you know, I'm good. You still don't have a business. And there's nothing wrong with these things. I want to make sure that I'm clear on this. We are not... We're not judging these things, but you need to have visual acuity and clarity around this is what I really have versus, oh, this is what I have and, and you're way over here, but this is what you want. You need to be clear on what you have and what you want. And if they're the same, great. And if they're not, how are you gonna bridge the gap, right? So if you're not treating it like a real business, you gotta shift that if you wanna to wanna to be a creative entrepreneur. Um, you know, you've got to be focused on growing your company as a business owner, not just another employee in, you know, in the system of, of things that you're doing here. Um, number three, and this is a corollary. Several of these kind of go together, but I, they were so important. They needed to have their, <laughs> their own point. So point number three is you don't do marketing. Like you do not spread the word about your little lemonade stand. Okay. You don't even tell anybody that it's there. You're like, oh, if I build it, they will come. Let's get clear on this. Fail the dreams is a total misnomer because here's what happened in the movie. The voice said, if you build it, he will come. That's one person. You cannot build a business on one person, all right? And then the notion in the movie was he'll come and then he'll go back and tell his friends and then they'll come. And that's what James Earl Jones says is, they'll come. If you sell tickets, they'll come, right? But people had to find out about this. Word had to spread. That's marketing, baby. You gots to do the marketing. If you don't do the marketing, if you don't tell people, if you're in your little corner of the world and you're just creating your little stuff to create stuff, you're not really a creative entrepreneur. And I say that with love because you can make stuff with no intention of marketing it. That's totally fine, but be clear, you got a hobby, not a business, okay? And Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison is my man for this. He once said, um, he once said that I am, let me, let me look at it so I don't lie to you and misquote Thomas Edison. All my life, I've been a commercial inventor. I have never dabbled in anything that was not useful. So we know Edison as this great inventor, right? And all these things, but he also was a little less than reputable around taking credit for some of the discoveries that his people were creating for him on his behalf or as part of his research organization. I don't wanna talk about the politics today. I wanna to talk about this concept of, he had one particular, he had two particular inventions that he spent a lot of time and money working on and they didn't have a market. One of them was the electric vote tracker, which I find hysterical. It's basically, is basically an electra, electronic or electric system of tabulating and collecting votes in Congress. And he thought this is great, it was gonna save taxpayer money because we wouldn't pay, be paying these Congress people for all this time of tallying votes and all of that. And they quashed it because they thought that it would take away from one of the things that Congress is really known for, all of that time being on the platform talking about how important their stuff is. So this great idea died on the vine. The other thing he plowed a lot of money into was this mining process where he actually purchased a mine and a processing facility, right? And the idea was he was gonna crush the ore fine enough and run it past an electromagnetic setup that was going to extract the iron from this ore because quantity speaking, it was like 
7,000 pieces of rock that was mostly worthless and one tiny little bit of ore that was valuable. So the extraction process was time consuming and costly and he had developed this w way to do this that was really gonna work in a better, more efficient manner, but he couldn't get it up and running because he'd get one piece going and something else would fall apart. And so he was like spinning plates and he actually stepped into the business and tried to run it himself and lost a lot of money because he wasn't in his zone of genius anymore. And he was constantly putting out fires that were not moving the ball down the field for what he was originally known for, what his great work was, and that was the invention process, not the running the business process, right? So he loses a bunch of money and then he says, um, I will never ever again <laughs> invent a technology that doesn't have an apparent market. I'm not just going to invent things for the sake of inventing them, but to be able to sell them. So a completely different extreme. He was creative entrepreneur to the core. Like, boy was like, if I can't sell it, I ain't making it. I ain't gonna waste my time on it, let's move on, okay? Most creative entrepreneurs I know don't show up in the world that way. They're creating because it's it's coming from a place of passion, it's coming from a gift that they have and a skill set that they wanna share. And then people are like, hey, I'll pay you for that. Oh, okay. But again, we're talking about the whole spectrum here. Edison was very much on the linear side of the equation. So that's number three. Number four, again, that corollary that goes along with running your business like a business, but bears its own little caveat here. You don't look at your numbers. You don't even look at them. You got your head stuck in the sand. You're like, I don't know if I made money or not, but the bank account's positive, so I guess we're okay. Yeah, no, you can't do that. <laughs> if you don't even take the time to look at the numbers, you're not really a creative entrepreneur. And this is a habit you have to get into about looking at the numbers without judgment and realizing those numbers are not where I want them to be. I don't like that they're not where I want them to be. And I have to have this clarity so that I can know what to do next. I've worked with, and this is especially true for chaotic entrepreneurs who either rail against numbers and structures and systems, or they freak out and they're like, I don't know numbers, I'm not a numbers person. BS, if you are going to be a creative entrepreneur, you've gotta be able to look at the numbers without judgment. And very often, that's the problem. You can look at your numbers, but you start to judge it. And you get freaked out by the judging of, it's not what I want, it's not where I want it to be, I'm going backwards, whatever, instead of going, huh, I spent $3,000 this month and I only brought in a thousand. I think that's gonna have to change if I wanna stay in business. There are gonna be months where you overspend. An unexpected expense, an unexpected opportunity, a great investment that's going to help the future of your business, those things do come up. But if they're coming up all the time because you're not paying attention to the numbers, there's a problem. There's a problem you got to fix. Okay. Now this doesn't mean you have to put on your spectacles and become an accountant and know all of you know where all the beans are all the time. But you do need to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in your business. In her autobiography, Put on Your Crown by Queen Latifah, love this book. Great book. Okay. So Queen Latifah talks about how at one point in her business, when she was making good money, she had hired a financial manager to kind of run, sign all the checks and pay all the bills and all of that. And through no fault, nobody, nobody was trying to intentionally screw here, here, okay? A check went out and it was an overpayment or something like that and it screwed up the books. She didn't have any money to pay the other bills. And she is scrambling, trying to make bill payments and keep everybody on payroll accounted for and she doesn't have any money. So this wasn't a case of her, her financial manager was trying to screw her. It wasn't that at all. She just didn't know what was going on. And so she didn't catch that the check went out for the wrong amount and then had to wait for the money to come back and all of that, right? So she was watching an episode of Oprah where Oprah said, never let anybody else sign the checks. Always sign the checks yourself. And she's like, why are you just now telling me this now, Oprah? Like, come on, I should have known this a long time ago. Why are you just now telling me this, right? So then she changed her approach to always sign the checks. She may not know everything that's going on in her business because she's got an empire, right? But when that check comes, she checks it out and she's like, huh, isn't this supposed to be 
for $7 and not $70? Oh, hey, this one isn't right. Or, wow, did we really spend that much money on that this month? Like, it gives her a sense of awareness about what's really going on in her business. It doesn't have to be ornate. It doesn't have to be super complicated or hard. You just need to know what the heck's going on. One great way to do that is to just sit down once a week. Some people call it their Monday money meeting or whatever. Sit down and just look at it. Take away all the judgment and just get in the habit of, I'm going to look at my numbers today. How many opt-ins did I get? How many new subscribers? How many new buyers? What did I offer? Did I even make an offer this week? What kind of revenue did I bring in? What kind of money did I spend? Again, practicing dropping the judgment. You gotta let that stuff go. Because if you don't let it go, that's gonna be the part where all of the anxiety and the, oh my God, I don't have enough to pay the rent and I can't and ooh, you gotta let it go. You just gotta let all that go and get in the habit. It's just like brushing your teeth. Today I'm gonna check my numbers, today I'm gonna brush my teeth. It's just a habit. We don't obsess over, oh my God, I can't believe I got to brush my teeth again today. I just had, just did this yesterday. And oh my God, what if there's a caveat? We just brush our freaking teeth. Just check your freaking numbers. Because if you don't, you're probably not really a creative entrepreneur. Because by reviewing your numbers consistently, even if they're not where you want them to be, you get to keep yourself in the know. And knowledge is power, right? Was that G.I. Joe thing? And now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Like, that's it. Once you know better, you can do better. You can't improve something that you're not aware of. So there's that. All right, time for number five. And this one I think is a, is a hidden sign that most people don't even realize until they're in the throes of building their business. So number five is you don't trust other people to help you grow. You don't trust others to help you grow. Now I'm not saying give over control of everything to just some random dude on the street. Okay. So it's not that you don't trust people in general. It's like you don't trust the people that you've empowered to actually run these elements of your business. Um, hi, Deborah. Thanks for joining. I'm so excited that you're here. And yeah, we brush our teeth because we have to, and, and we don't complain about it. We look at our numbers because we have to, and we don't complain about it. And we trust the people that we've employed to do the work in our business. If you're constantly helicopter parenting your staff or the people that you've delegated to and you can't trust them to do the work for you, you've either hired the wrong person or you've got some control issues that you've got to deal with. Worse, if you don't trust anybody and you won't let anybody take on anything, you become the bottleneck and everything gets stuck right here and it's all got to pass through your grip before it can go out into the world. Now, when you're brand new and you're just starting, you're wearing all the hats. So of course you're the bottleneck. There's no way around it unless you're, you know, got a slush fund somewhere, you're infinite, independently wealthy and you can just throw money at things. But even that is dangerous. I've had clients who are like, well, I'll just pay for this and I'll just pay for this and I'll just pay for this. And the next thing you know, they're $20,000 down on a website that doesn't do what it needs to do, but it sure looks great. So having a lot of money isn't always the answer either. But what is the answer is finding the right people and putting them in the right positions and trusting them to do the work. Again, that doesn't mean you completely take your hands off and walk away. Always sign the checks, remember? Keep your finger on the pulse and know what's going on, okay? If you can't trust other people to help you grow your business, you're creating a jobby for yourself, okay? You know, and each of the different types can suffer through this control freakishness stuff for different reasons. Chaotic won't trust that other people can meet their high standards. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes you need to let those high standards go because you're, you're nickel and diming over silly stuff. I want it to be green and it's puce, you know? Is that really important in the grand scheme of you need to bring money in this month? Maybe, maybe the color needs to just wait, okay? No, 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 it's gotta be excellent and perfect. I hear that and you don't have the budget for excellent and perfect. You gotta let that go, right? So chaotics are like, oh, but I have this high level of excellent perfection that we must strive to attain. And if we can't, then I don't want to ship. I don't want to put it out into the world. I don't want to let the world see it. That web page is ugly. I don't want the world to see it. Yeah, but ugly web pages sell stuff too. What's more important, pretty or selling your stuff? Let's just be clear on what the priorities are, okay? If you're caught up in that, you're probably not really a creative entrepreneur. 
And I say that with love, right? So fusions will give up on it because they're so used to doing everything themselves and clinging to, it's just faster if I do it myself. And sometimes that's true. For fusion creatives, sometimes it is faster because we're quick studies and we've already got a breadth of knowledge around a lot of different things. Yeah, it's probably faster for me to go in and edit that image than it is to craft the email, attach the image, send it to the VA, give her the instructions, tell her what to do, have her send it back, and then have me check the work. But if I trust her to do that a couple of times, and I know she knows how, once she's demonstrated proficiency, now I can just give it all to her and go, it's all yours. You have control. Hi, Helena. So good to see you. Welcome. One of the things that I learned in working with one of my clients Les McCune um, was the author of the book, Predictable Success. And I've probably talked about him before because his business life cycle is the foundation of how I teach entrepreneurs to grow their business. And when I was working with him, he said to me, when you're flying a plane and the pilot is ready to pass control to the co-pilot, he always says, you have control. And until the co-pilot acknowledges that he has now had taken control of the plane, the pilot remains in control of the plane. So he said to me, because we were working on a project, you have control. And I'm like, all right, cool, got it. And he's like, no, you have control. And I'm like, oh, I have control. I, have, I am now responsible for the success or failure of this piece of the business that he has entrusted me with, right? So when you bring on a team member, I don't care if it's for one project or for a whole division of your company, you have to entrust them once they've demonstrated proficiency and let them have control. And most of you won't. Linears have this problem because they will micromanage deadlines and budgets. Are we there yet? Did we hit it yet? Are we there yet? Did we make it? How much did we make? What are we at? Where are we at? All the time. And people will run screaming for the hills because they don't want to work with that helicopter micromanager. Right? So three different types, same problem, different reasons. If you're not willing to trust other people, then you probably don't have a business. You've probably got an adventure. <laughs> You're probably driving some people crazy. <laughs> okay. And now that doesn't mean you have to compromise on what really matters. Okay. But chances are good that you are worrying more about things that don't need to be worried about at this point. Oh my gosh, my website is horrible. You've got three subscribers on your newsletter list. Not worried that your website's ugly. Does it have an opt-in form? Can you market to people? You're going to be fine. We can make it pretty as we go, truthfully. I get it, especially if you're chaotic. It, it isn't at your standard of excellence. I'm sorry, unless you've got lots of money to throw at it. Don't worry about that right now. And I know that can be hard. It's like, but, but, but I, but, but. You just gotta let it go. <laughs> and I know that's hard. That's part of what I do when I'm working with my clients. It's like, I know you said that's important, but which one of these things is more important? This one, okay, well then this is what we're gonna do and we're gonna let that one go for a minute, okay? Is that all right with you? No, it's not all right with me, but I guess we have to. Yes, drop the judgment, let's keep moving, right? So I wanna circle back and remind you that everybody is creative, right? This is not a question about, I'm not, I'm not, calling you out on whether or not you're creative because I know you are. You're a human being. You exist in this world. You've created something in your lifetime and you will continue to create because you're a human being. We are creators by design, right? So this isn't about are you a creative? It's about are you a creative entrepreneur? Are you choosing to do this thing you love in a way that supports you, nourishes you and creates a legacy financially for you so you don't have to have another job somewhere else at some point. Now you can be a creative entrepreneur and still be working a day job, okay? It's not about how much time you invest, it's about what's your intention around this, okay? Um, entrepreneurs are especially adept at seeing a need and creating something to fill it, but not all creatives are entrepreneurs, like I said before. The dictionary definition of entrepreneur is someone who takes a greater than normal risk, um, financially speaking, to organize or operate a business, right? So most of the creatives I know, oh great, the lawnmower is running. Um, most of the creatives I know don't want more risk, but it's part and parcel to being a creative entrepreneur. They want stability. Stability doesn't come from entrepreneurship until after you've been in it a while. You create your own stability. Hi, Kat, how are you? Yes, drop the judgment. Hi, Melanie, good to see you too. So 
you get freaked out about this nature of risk and the notion of the starving artist. And oh my God, that's really risky. So I'm just gonna stay over here in my little hobby circle and, and keep doing it this way. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no judgment there. But I would, I would hazard a guess that there's a difference between your growing edge and your bleeding edge. The bleeding edge is where you're hitting up against something and it hurts. And it's hard in very painful ways, but not painfully constructive ways. You're doing something that's outside of who you were really meant to be in the world. And you're pushing on that blade, on that edge, and it's cutting you. Your growing edge, on the other hand, is more like the seed coming through the soil. It's hard. There's resistance. You've got to push through it sometimes. And yet when you come through to the other side, there's growth. There's expansion. There's lightness of being because you recognize this is what I'm really meant to do. And what I find with creative entrepreneurs is when they step into that space for the first time and own that they really want to make this a going concern and they really want to make a living doing what they love, they're pushing into that growing edge, even if it's uncomfortable, versus the bleeding edge of staying in that space of this is just a hobby because I don't have confidence that I can do something more. I don't have the courage to step out and own this because it's just me and all the voices and all the fear and all the, all the, all that has been rolling down and piling up on me for so long. Okay. They're, you know, like, like Elizabeth Gilbert, they're content to rely on their day job and just dabble in their creative work during their hobby time. And if that's you, there's no judgment there. I mean, you probably don't need this book. You probably don't need to come to creative live. You don't need to take my classes, but there's no judgment around that. It's about you being clear on who you really are, what really matters to you, and how you really want to show up in the world. So if you want to transition from the day job, if you're already knee deep in your creative work and you need some clarity and some direction to make it a profitable, sustainable business, then that's what we do here at Creative Freedom. That's what this is all about, right? I developed this creative entrepreneur type spectrum because I wanted entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs, to have the clarity that they needed about how to best set up and run their business in a way that works for who they are, for what really matters to them. Hi, Kara, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. It's like a big party up in here. All you guys are here today, this is so great, right? So I want you to play to your strengths. I want you to, to have the resources that you need that work for you. Now, does that mean you're gonna hit six figures in six seconds? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know what kind of resources you have and I don't pretend to know, right? But you can get clear on what are your ninja skills? What are your blind spots? How can you be more productive using what you've got versus trying to fit yourself into a mold where you clearly don't belong? That's what this work is all about. And that's why I'm so excited to be able to bring it to the world. Now, does it take longer or more effort to build a business doing something you love? It depends on you. My experience and that of my clients is that whether it takes longer or not, it's worth it because it's fulfilling. You may work the same amount of hours as you did in your day job, but it feels completely different. You may work more hours and it still feels different. And you show up differently with more joy, more ease, more clarity, more confidence. And like, who doesn't wanna be more confident and clear and courageous in their own life and in their own being and how they show up in the world? When I was in junior high school, my band director, Debbie Smith, Lord Lover, she said, I'm not teaching you how to be good musicians, I'm teaching you how to be good people. And so the music part comes along with that, right? So when I'm working with clients, I talk about this 360 degree view, this holistic business design. Like, I want you to be good people, not just great entrepreneurs, I want you to have a great life. I want you to have a great sense of yourself. And that's why I do what I do. You know, you're building a long-term asset instead of looking for the short-term low-hanging fruit. And often it's easier because your efforts are bolstered by the fact that you're doing something that you love instead of something that you dread. So let me hear from you. If you haven't already made a comment in the comments, please do. I love to hear what you guys are thinking about. Did you see yourself in any of these issues? Is anything coming up for you around these five points? Do you have to learn how to trust people? Do you need to spend more time looking at your numbers? Do you need to be the one to sign the checks? <laughs> you know, what, what's coming up for you and what we talked about? Did I miss something? Did I forget about some super, super really important thing that, oh, you know, well, what about this piece? I love to have conversations. So leave your thoughts and ideas in the comments. Uh, let's be a rising tide for everybody because that's really what I love to do is one, one question that you have, 25 other people might have, and one solution or idea that you have, 100 or 50, 100 
people might need. So please feel free to, to share your thoughts and comments there. Um, any takeaways that you have from this episode, I always look forward to hearing those as well. Um, if you liked this episode and want to be the first to find out when new episodes are coming, then you're going to want to make sure that you subscribe, share me with your friends, like and share to show you care. That's, that's what we like to say. Um, and remember, this is an excerpt from my new book, Creative Freedom. Um, and if you haven't already taken the quiz, you can do that. Um, at the website and learn your type, learn your blind spots, learn your ninja skills. Um, you'll also, also get updated about the um, release of the book when it's ready to come out. You can do that at lisarobinyoung.com forward slash quiz. Notice Robin has two Bs, lisarobinyoung.com forward slash quiz. Quiz is free, so yeah, nothing to lose. Show up and learn more about yourself. That's always, self-discovery is always a cool thing. Um, and folks coming to my live event in October, they're going to be the first ones to get their hands on this book. And like, as I was talking about earlier, this book not only talks about the spectrum, it helps you recognize your blind spots and your ninja skills. And then how do you actually build a business that takes advantage of what you're really good at versus miring you in the stuff that sucks your soul dry, right? <laughs> <laughs> Elena says, I'm chaotic, but I'd rather be a fusion like you. And it's funny because your type is your type. It's based on your preference, how you choose to show up. And there are gifts that chaotics have that I don't have because I'm a fusion. And there are gifts that linears have that I don't have because I'm a fusion. The nice thing about being a fusion is that I can kind of borrow from both sides. But the downside is I get oppressed by both both energies as well. If I spend too much time looking at numbers, I'm like, I want to burn the world down. I just can't handle it. On the other hand, if I stay too much in the realm of the chaotic, which is going with the flow and trusting your gut, I lose all sense of my identity and what's really important to me because I'm going wherever the wind takes me, that, that Pocahontas effect. So it's important for me to stay rooted in what's true for me, just like it is for you, Helena, to stay rooted in what's true for you. One of the gifts that you have that I adore is your ability to connect with people. You can walk into a room. I've seen it. She walks into a room and people are like, oh my God, Helena Summer, blah, and they go nuts. They just absolutely love her. And that's a gift that you've been given that not everybody else can have. You don't see people fangirl crushing that hard on a linear type. Linears walk into the room and people go, hi, nice to see you. How are you doing? It's great to see you, blah, 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 blah. So, Play to your strengths, you know? Chaotics make great celebrities because people just adore them. And that's a gift, so, so play to that. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll see you in October. I know you haven't made a decision yet, no pressure. I'm sorry, I should, shouldn't have said that. But anyways, um, but it was my segue because the people who come to the event in October are gonna be the first people to get a copy of this book. They're going to be the first ones that see that whole process. They're actually going to put it into practice at the event. They're going to look at their type. They're going to learn those strengths. And then we're going to build out a plan for them for the next year that says, okay, based on you being a chaotic, here are the things that you need to keep in mind and let's build this out. And now let's take action so that they know what they're doing for the next 12 months. They have clarity on, I just need to follow these steps. And when this, you know, if something goes out of whack, here's how I get back on track. And that's what we're going to do at Creative Freedom Live in October. The dates are October 12th through the 14th here in Nashville. You can reserve your seat at creativefreedomlive.com. There aren't a lot of seats available for this. This is a very small, intimate group because we're going to sit down and look at your specific type and how this really applies to you, right? I can't do that in a room with 500 people because I want to make sure that you've got clarity and you know exactly what you need to do to move forward. So that's what the event is going to be like um, this fall. So um, that is really going to wrap it up for us today. If you've got more comments, please feel free to pop them in there because I'll come back and circle back later and share them. All of the resources that I mentioned in this episode, you can find at the link in the comments. Um, on my blog, so you don't have to worry about what what book did she say? Where does she go? They will all be there when this episode is concluded. And I'm just so thrilled that you guys were here today. Um, next week, we are going to talk about the three different kinds of growth plans. The event link 
She says, Deborah says, where's the event link? The event link's right here, creativefreedomlive.com. That's where you can go to learn more about the event in Nashville. Um, but next week, we're going to talk about the three different kinds of growth plans. And this is one of the things we're going to do in Nashville is you're going to build a growth plan. Well, where you, depending on where you're at in your business, you need a different kind of growth plan. Next week, we're going to talk about what are those three different kinds of growth plans and how do you know which one's right for you. Um, that way, whether or not you come to the event, you've got an opportunity to really kind of buckle down and get clarity on what are my next 12 months going to look like as I'm rolling into 2018? How can I move forward in a way that's really going to work for who I am and what matters most to me? So until then, for more inspiring songs, stories, tools, resources to help you own your dreams without selling your soul, come see what's shaking over at lisarobinyoung.com, and I will see you there. Take care, you guys. Have a great day.